Hi guys and welcome into my channel. Thank you so much for tuning into today's video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about Kepra from the ancient kingdom of Kemet, which is in modern day society known as Egypt. But in that very same location, a long time ago existed a kingdom called Kemet. If you've been watching any of my videos, if you've been tuning into my channel, then you may have already watched some of my other series related to the topic of some of these different deities and how they correlate with the different star signs inside of astrology. So in this video, I'm going to be continuing that with today's topic of Kepra. Kepra is a dung beetle and it also has different representations inside of the kingdom of Kemet. It describes the movement of the sun. It describes the movement of life, the movement of seasons that we experience in life. It describes all of these different things. And the thing about Kemet and the wisdom with Kemet is it provides so much knowledge and different nuggets of wisdom for us to take inside of our life. Not just inside of our life with how much money we could make or how much material wealth we can gain, but inside of our life when it comes to how are we going to proceed when we die, life after death. It provides us with the wisdom that we need to know in order to really prepare ourselves to know thyself so that when that time comes, when death arises, we will be able to go peacefully with a lightweight heart. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see what we can learn about the star sign Kepra. Okay, so what is Kepra? Who is Kepra? What is this thing, Kepra? So Kepra is basically a dung beetle. Yes, it's a dung beetle. And it's important for me to say that it's not really a big stressor to worry about whether it's a dung beetle, a scarab beetle, because a scarab beetle is basically just a type of dung beetle. So at the end of the day, a scarab beetle is still a dung beetle. It's just slightly smaller in size and um, has a lot more tentacles coming out of it than a regular dung beetle would but a scarab beetle is still just a dung beetle at the end of the day so what is this dung beetle and why is it so important why was it so important to commit comedians well basically when it comes to the dung beetle the dung beetle is a beetle that first represents love that's the first thing about the dung beetle. It actually represents love. It represents love and devotion. Because when we look at the beetle overall, and we look at it from an animal totem standpoint, as some of you guys have seen my videos, you've seen me talk about animal totems, you know the wisdom that I've carried and the information I've gathered when it comes to different animal totems. And with beetles, they definitely represent unconditional love and they represent a love and devotion, which is unconditional love. When you are devoted to loving no matter what, that is unconditional love. And the beetles do represent that. So that's the first thing to know about the beetle is the fact that it does represent love. The next thing about these dung beetles in particular is what they do and how they've gotten their name. So they're called the dung beetle because what they do is They'll go and they'll look for mainly elephant poop or just any type of poop that's very, that's actually filled with a lot of nutrients, the poop that they look for. They go and they look for dung and they will actually bury their larva inside of that dung, okay? And they don't just go to any dung. They make sure that they're going to the dung that has a lot of minerals. And the interesting thing about the dung, when they put their their eggs and their larva inside of this dung, what ends up happening is the dung ends up feeding the larva, feeding the larva so it could go to the, its very next stages inside of its larva stages. So the very dung that Kepra puts their larva inside 
is the same dung that is actually protecting, feeding, fueling, and nourishing and comforting that larva. It's comforting what it is that they have planted inside of there, which is a life form, right? So the Keparas definitely represent fertility because of the fact that it is doing that act of being fertile, right? Everything inside of nature is pretty fertile. Um, there's even a quote by Nirvana, nature is a whore. <laughs> and it's true because nature is very fertile. Fertility and giving birth and laying eggs and all these things is just a part of nature. So a lot of things inside of nature represent fertility. But in particular with the dung beetle, it definitely is amplified as a representation of fertility because of how much love and devotion they go through and hard work and effort they go through in order to really providing a sense of security for their larva, okay? They have to do a lot of scouting, a lot of work in order to protect their larva and to nourish their larva. Their larva is also buried inside of what some may consider you know, poop is in a very nasty place. But it's also a representation when we think of Kepra, the dung beetle is also a representation of how light in life can come out of a dark place, of how the sun comes from darkness, of how light comes from darkness, and of how life itself, these larvas that will burst open one day out of the dung is coming out from a smelly stinky dark place little do we know that this smelly stinky dark poo poo actually contains a lot of different bacterias that are actually prolonging the life of the larva and protecting it so that's a very interesting thing to note and a very interesting nugget of wisdom to take when we're looking at the symbolism of kepra it goes as deep as just seeing a scarab beetle on your path or seeing beetles as a synchronicity and as a totem it is going to represent these things it's going to represent um love life love light being birth even inside of a dark place devotion occurring even inside of a challenging situation you still have love in your heart and devotion and this directly correlates with the representations and the descriptions of the star sign cancer it has to deal with fertility it has to deal with the mother it has to deal with nourishment and there's nothing going on except for nourishment when those that larva is inside of that dung and that poop it's being nourished 24 7 it's being nourished so another thing and another phase of the kepra is the fact that this dung beetle, after it buries its, its larva inside of the dung, it will actually roll it into a ball and it'll make sure that it's inside of a ball form, right? Now, after it makes sure it's inside of a ball form and that their larva is completely immersed and surrounded by the protection of the dung, they actually roll it up a hill so that it can get the highest uh, depths of sunlight to also help to fertilize those eggs or to prolong its life or to give it more light and life, right? And vitality, because the sun is vitality. So going back to ancient kingdom of Kemet, when they saw the dung beetle rolling its dung up the hill, you will see on ancient Kemetic scriptures inside of the tombs, inside of the Meduneter, you'll see inside of their scriptures, the Kepra beetle holding a sun disk, just like that. And they really held the symbolism of Kepra very high because it was reminding them of how all the other deities also have that sun. It reminded them of the sun, 
it reminded them of the sun and not just the sun, but it reminded them of a specific phase of the sun. And you'll notice that a lot of deities have the sun disk around their head. And what you'll also notice as well is over time, because Kemet existed way before Babylonian time period, existed way before all of the, you know, Greek goddess and goddesses. It existed before Buddhism. Um, it existed before Vedic scriptures. And what you'll notice is a lot of these other um, religions also have a sun glowing around their deities as well. Right? So all of that is for me to just say that these deities and the religion of, you know, the comedic principles were a big influence on some of the religions that we see today. The comedic religion and principles, as far as all the Netarus go on the boat of Ra and the whole principle of the movement of life and the cosmology of the boat of Ra and all those deities on that boat of Ra, which is going to be a Netaru, which is the deity. So the Netarus that were on the boat of Ra, all of that scripture all influenced a lot of the religions that we see today. This comedic religion was also the first documented religion to be the first religion that's also monotheistic and polytheistic. So it was a religion that only had one god, which was Ra, but it also had poly of many gods because all these different Netarus that you see on the boat of Ra were pretty much birthed from Ra. They all came from Ra, but they all represent one divinity, which is Ra. And even more so the primeval waters of Nun. So it's really interesting to know this because now we know where some of these influences come from and then we can understand why um, a lot of times you'll see me in my video pointing out how things relate back to commit. Not everything relates back to commit, right? Um, but a lot of things relate back to commit and a lot of native, old native things like the bush people in the southern hemisphere of Africa or the um, aboriginals inside of Australia also studied the stars, also studied all the cosmology and the atmospheres and all of these different things. They also studied it and, and you will even see some of the similar things inside of their practices as well as commit because they knew how to work with the land, work with nature, and work with everything inside of our universe. So I'm not saying that the aboriginals and the native old, old, you know, kind of ancient, you know, native people stole things from commit. But I am saying the new age stuff was definitely influenced from the older, more ancient first people to do it and some of those people are Kemetians and is the ancient kingdom of Kemet. So back to the different phases of the sun, the different phases of life. When we think about Kepra, we are thinking about also the four stages of the sun, which is going to be the four stages of Ra because Ra is a personification of the sun. So you'll see when you study Kemetic scriptures, um, you'll see the four stages of Ra. Even when you study the book, um, you know, the book of the, of the dead, you'll see that that book is talking about life. Although it's talking about death, it is also talking about life. And the reason why is because once we're born, we're pretty much already dead because time um, exists here. The experience of time exists here, 
but in other realms it doesn't really exist or it doesn't move as fast or it's not really a principle because you're just as much dead as you are alive. In that book, it's also a reminder that although we're living inside of this life, the actions that we take inside of this life is what really matters. The principles that we have, the, the how, how light is our heart, how much grief do we have on our heart, how much attachments do we have on our heart center or our heart chakra, how much um, attachments do we have, are we able to let go of things, let go of people, let go of um, situations, let go of instances, let go of traumas, are we able to let go of these things? So that way, when time comes for death, we've already practiced dying while living. So when we go to death, we can actually rest as opposed to keep being reincarnated. And that is part of the Kemetic principles. And that's also talked about inside of the book. Um, another thing that is talked about is the four stages of raw. So... Ra is basically going to be the sun, like I said, but it's also a representation of life because although we know the sun is burning 24-7 round clock, right, for our planet Earth to sustain itself, but no matter where you are, where your vantage point is on the Earth, at some point, even if you have more daylight in the day than night, like they will in some areas of um, the world, you'll see that there it could be eight o'clock and the sun will be super bright and still shining. Um, it'll be eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, and the sun will still be beaming, like as if it's 12 o'clock at night. Even with that, night still comes. So there's still a cycle of life when you are on the vantage point of Earth where you will see the sun go through its different phases. The first phase of Ra is Kepra, when the sun's coming up and it's just now becoming like morning time. The second stage of Ra is noon and that's when Ra is in his, his highest um, vitality. That's when he was basically his strongest, you know? And then um, Atum Ra, Atum Ra, A-T-U-M-N, what do we think of autumn? That's when Ra is basically in his autumn season. But Atum Ra is a word that existed way before English was even, you know, made up or created. The word Atum in representation of coming to die, basically, coming to rest. So that's the phase of Ra when it's the evening time and the sun is going down. That's the evening time. That is the sunset. That is when Ra and the storytelling of Ra in the four phases of the sun, or the four phases of Ra, when, when they're storytelling about him inside of these books, they talk about how that's when he was becoming weak and old. And he actually had to um, talk to Aset in order to, you know, kind of bring him back to life where Aset needed his secret name in order to, 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 to give him back his life again. But all that being said, I've already made a video with uh, a really good guest called the Comedic Pisces. And that video I'll link over here if you want to go in depth about the four stages of Ra. And then the last stage of Ra is basically at night because the sun is not dead. Although it's nighttime, the sun is still there, right? So although it's winter time, although it's the death season, um, life still exists. So life is still existent, even after death, even after the darkness, even when the sun goes away. So the four stages of Ra and the cosmology of ancient Kemet and its storytelling and its deities and its personifications and its symbolisms um, really represent life. They really represent a way of life, a way of living life so that your soul can be this purest and stay its purest and so that you can ascend whilst you're inside of this physical body you can know thyself and still know that you're of divine or of the divinity so they use nature as a describer of all of these things now 
I'm talking about Kefra. I might not be able to say every single thing about Kefra, but I'm gonna say as much as I can squeeze inside of a video for you guys. And yes, this video may be a little bit on the lengthy side, but it has to be in order for me to really teach and explain in the correct way. So, Kepper also represents initiation. It represents a start of something. When we're talking about the seasons, it can represent springtime because the first phase of Ra being Kepra is when the sun just came out. So that's initiation, that's birth. It represents birth, it represents beginnings. It represents fresh starts. And that goes back to the star sign of Cancer, which they put the crab there, but really they took that from Kemet and it's really supposed to be the dung beetle that's supposed to be there, right? And that's fine. Modern day astrology, especially Western astrology can have its thing, that's okay. But it's also good to know some of the origins of these things. So that's the whole point is where is the origin of these things? Where does it really come from? Is there more wisdom to learn? Is, are there other perspectives of this? Or should everyone just stay inside of a little box of um, whatever it is that's being fed inside of modern day society and not know the origins or even the more evolved, um, you know, religions and understandings of life that there are? So Kepper's going to represent that. It's going to also represent um, even a baby. Kepper's going to represent baby. It's going to also represent home. And when we think about Vedic astrology, we think about cancer, we're thinking about the fourth house, which represents your home life. Um, why is it that Kepra represents home? Well, Kepra is providing a home for its, it's providing a structure, it's providing a home for its larva. And it's rolling that larva up to the sun so it can get, you know, sunlight. This is all uh, chemistry. Um, that is happening. This is all alchemy that is occurring with this bug. So the bug is essentially like a mother figure in a sense. So that also has to deal with Kepra, the home that it's providing. Um, it's also about the emotions, right? Because when you're a newborn, when you're a baby, you're extremely emotional. As a matter of fact, most of the things you do is cry. And even if you're a baby that doesn't cry that much, or even if you, you observe a baby that isn't crying that much, they still have so much pure emotion with them that even dogs love them, animals love them. Um, for the most part, a right-headed animal that hasn't been abused or starved will actually not feed on a baby, even if it's a lion. They won't feed on a baby human. They won't even feed on a pregnant woman. They won't go after that. So this is all coming back to the sign of cancer. Cancer is a sign that is actually Kepra. And even more so, understanding Kepra will give you more knowledge on the star sign of cancer than learning about modern representation of the crab. Learning about Kepra will give you more insight on the star sign of Cancer than it will if you learn about the crab. Another thing to note when I say these things about the origins of these star signs being from Kemet, it's a process where you really have to unlearn what you've already learned in order to gain more wisdom. Because even though it's the origins, it doesn't mean that every single thing that is associated with cancer is also associated with that religion. Because they took some and they left some, and then they created something else. So just because Kepra inside of the Kemetic Kingdom represented springtime, and it doesn't necessarily represent springtime inside of modern day astrology, doesn't mean that there isn't a code there where it does actually represent that, where you can get outside of the box of the cancer star sign, you know, description and, 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 and understand even more 
about that star sign. So it's going to represent these things. Now, when it comes to Kepra, Kepra is going to be how you're going to pronounce it. That is going to be its original name. You will also see it be pronounced as Kepri, which is okay. And you can also see it pronounced as Kepra, which is just as fine as well. Um, all of these are pretty close to its original name. It comes a time when there's things like Aset and Isis, where it's good to understand the different terminologies of it, but it's good to understand that Aset is its original name. Just like Asar and you see Osiris, two completely different things. Asar, when you read the Nedu, the Medu Netter, when you read the Medu Netter and you look at their scripture and you see how everything is written, you can see which names are actually Kemetic and which names are actually Greek. Because Osiris is not a word that you're going to even find that much inside of the Medu Netter. You're not even going to find the pronunciation of it, Osiris, inside of the Medu Netter. You're not even gonna see the type, the, the way the language is formulating the words is not the same as it is in Medu Netter. But Asar, Asar is definitely the language of the Medu Netter. Even Heru, Heru, it sounds more comedic than Horus, which is the Greek name for Heru. Horus, that doesn't even sound comedic. That sounds Greek. So it's good to understand all these things. But Kepra, Kepara, and Kepri are pretty much, you know, pretty close to its original state. So you'll see it being called these different things. You may also see Kepra in the form of just the dung beetle itself holding the sun disk or on its own. Most of the times you will see it holding the sun disk because it's holding the sun disk even on the boat of Ra you'll see a representation where there's like a boat of Kepra, where when we look at the name Kepra, Kepra is still Ra. You know what I'm saying? It's like Ra birthed all these different, these different things. Like I said, it's a monotheistic religion as well as a polytheistic religion all at the same time. So Kepra is a phase of Ra. Kepra is a phase of the sun. Um, Kepra reminded them of the sun disc when it was rolling, when they rolled their dung filled with eggs up, filled with life, filled with light in order to be charged by the sun. And so all this is very really important to know. When you see the boat of Kepra, it's really also still the boat of Ra, really, when you think about it. So you'll see that you'll also see a deity called Kepra where he may have uh, arms like the the dung beetle and a head like the dung beetle but a body of a man or you will see him with just the head of a dung beetle and the body of a man we talked about the four stages of Ra and we also talked about the representation of Kepra and what it means, what it does, why it represents fertility, why it represents initiation, why it represents a start. And we, we even went down and dived into Kemet science and Kemet's um, religion, the Kemetic religion, and how it relates to living life in a certain principle so that way at the end of the road when you reach the point where you're going to leave the tall realm ta taurus 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 ta is going to be earth ta represents earth inside of the medu netter the medu netter is basically just the language or the scripture the means of communication inside of Kemet. Um, and when you leave the tall realm, which is the gross realm, it's also known as the gross realm, um, very physical realm, very heavy, dense realm. When you leave that realm, 
you go into the realm of pet, the realm of pet is going to be the astral realm. Above that, there's the duat. And above that, you have the home where you go to rest. So when we think about the four stages of raw, it's basically also representing, it's also representing the life cycle and the different realms. It's representing the totality of, of, of existence in itself because it's representing the sun is giving us life here on earth. Without the sun, the earth would not exist right so thank you sun but as it's giving life on earth as the sun is also giving life on earth the sun is also when we watch the movement of the sun it is also going to be providing a lot of wisdom of life itself and how the life cycle works hey hello hi hello 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 So we're also looking at the movement of life and the life cycle of the world overall and how the world works. So yeah, guys, <laughs> that is going to be it, really. I can go in depth about, you know, Kepra and go in depth about it. But at the end of the day, that's going to be in short what Kepra is symbolizing. That's how it relates to the star sign Cancer. That's how it relates to all of these things. I also want to go ahead and mention that even when we talk about astrology overall, when we follow astrology and we follow the modern day astrology, it's important to note that when you look at Western astrology, the degrees are different than the degrees in Vedic astrology. And personally for me, you're capable of believing in whatever you want to believe, doing whatever you want to do, but a lot of people don't even know the difference between Western astrology and Vedic astrology and why Vedic astrology may actually provide more sense or more wisdom for you. So in Vedic astrology, Vedic astrology counts in the lunar cycle, the solar cycle, and it also counts in a third cycle of the earth being tilted on its axis. When the earth is tilted on its axis, which it always is tilted on its axis. The earth is tilted on its axis. And yes, the earth wobbles, but also there's a little wobble that's occurring on the earth's axis. So inside of this wobble, I can't even think of the word right now, y'all, but I'm gonna put the word on there. Basically what it is, is it is the different ages that we go through inside of this physical realm. So we're going through the age of Aquarius right now, as some of you guys may know, but this is the age of Hopi. Hopi is, a, Hopi is the original Aquarius. So this wobble adds a little bit more degrees and it changes the time frame of predictions in astrology from Vedic astrology and Western astrology. It also um, changes, you know, when certain planets are inside of a constellation, a star constellation. And that's the biggest difference of Western astrology and Vedic astrology. And Vedic astrology is actually a lot more accurate when it comes to these things. Now, you will see that both of these astrological formats still can make predictions and still can work. And the reason why is because it's a science and at the end of the day whilst one science may provide a little bit more information and a little bit more depth the other science is still accurate it just doesn't have as much information or as much as many depths as the other one does so thank you guys so much for tuning into this video i really hope that you guys can hear me i'm gonna have to cut the video short just because um, a lot of activity going on now and yeah if you guys want to continue to support my channel make sure that you check out the donation any donation helps even if it's just one dollar I'm still making crystals my handmade crystals are still up for grabs um, I have this one right now this is mine <laughs> this one isn't up for grabs but I have lots of onks available 
and I also have my I also have my readings if you guys are interested in an intuitive reading I pull cards and I will do a reading for you and I'll use my intuition to tell you what the divine source of your own soul is telling you is your next move what you should be focused on any spiritual guidance that is meant for only you to hear that is specific just for you will come up inside of your reading what it is you're meant to be doing in life right now what road you're supposed to be on how to fulfill your purpose even more or if you're just interested in a love reading a career reading um, or a specific question i can help you guys with that as well through booking a reading with me on www.bloomingwoman.com so check it out because that's where you'll be able to book a reading with me as well as the EFT therapy, which is a technique of tapping different acupuncture parts of the body, tapping these different parts of the body um, to release trauma so that your heart can be as light as a feather. So if you guys are interested in doing that with me, that is also available on my website as well. I really hope you guys enjoyed watching the video. Don't forget to hit the like button on this video. Don't forget to also subscribe to my channel and check out my website for more guidance, for more in-depth, sacred, 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 sacred healing because I'm not one of those people who are going to go live and um, do personal readings on live streams. I'm not one of those people who are going to put broadcast people's um, healing journeys that happen that needs to happen in a more sacred space. Um, there's a lot of information that needs to be kept sacred. There's a lot of circuit, 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 that deity. Um, there's a lot of sacred circuit things that need to be kept sacred so that the circuit can keep running, all right? Some things are just going to be hidden, knowledge. and. Doing personal readings is definitely something that's meant to be sacred. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. And I'll see you all inside of the next video. Love you guys. Until then, bye-bye.